welcome back to the Infus Podcast. This is Brian. This is Daryl. And this Daryl, it's time to decommission the wrench. I thought that was a very I thought it was decommissioning Captain Luther. What, what come on here? No, 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 that's the subtitle. So Sorry. funny enough, like well, look at it. I I don't know why I beamed into the subtitle, but I did not realize the name of the episode. Oh, yeah. Well, here, let me fix it. I added a word to the subtitle, Decommissioning Captain, Luth- Captain Luthor 2. <laughs> <laughs> T-O-O, meaning also, um, in proper grammar. Anyway, so this week we are obviously talking Soups and Lolo, Episode 8. We are talking The Boring, I mean, The Bad Batch, Episode 6, in The Social Justice Sisters. Uh, <laughs> and we have a bunch of news bites about... Um, superhero and comic book related tv shows <laughs> yeah like it's a whole theme uh but anyway before we get started how you doing it's friday it is today. friday it looks like all the rain is gone for now and it's it's some it's summertime yeah it, it, i i believe summer is here to stay yeah that's good though um don't bef- quote me on that no uh, before we get started, uh, we are going to be talking about this particular bit of news a lot. Uh, we have been invited to do a live episode at um, Fretboard Brewing in Blue Ash, Ohio, on Creek Road. Uh, you can go to our Facebook page, go to the events if you want to learn more about it. Um, actually, I should probably put a link to that in the show notes. Anyway, we will be doing a live show on July 19th. That's a Monday. Uh, starting at 7 until we decide to end. Um, they close at 10, so I'm pretty sure they'll let us go all the way to 10 if we want to. Uh, <laughs> That's kind of a long time. <laughs> oh, like you've never done a three-hour podcast before. Well, I, I, I haven't. <laughs> Actually, all the live ones I've done have been like six hours long. So, Because um, it's been like an all-day event. Uh, and it gets split into multiple episodes. But anyway, so, yeah, so they have a podcast series going on. We're going to go check out some of the other ones um, just to get the lay of the land. But if you can make it, that would be great. There will be prizes and swag and, you know, maybe the chance to get called up on stage and, and test, you know, how geeky you really are. Test your might. It's time to find out just how geeky you really are. <laughs> <laughs> I live in a world made of nerds. <laughs> or normies. Yeah, I live in a from. world made of normies. I'm always having to be careful <laughs> not to offend or, uh, or d- disrespect someone. But but you, you can take it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, that's a good call. Um Anyway, all right, so news bites this week. There's a bunch. Um, a lot of cool stuff happened. Uh, real quick, there was, like, a Neil Gaiman thing that happened, and I was going to talk about it, like, um, our Thursday, Daryl's uh, Trailerific Thursday um, videos exclusive to YouTube. Uh, but then I decided not to because there was no way I could not be negative about Neil Gaiman. And when I look back at my notes, I was just attacking him because I don't like him. I, I don't I'm, I know. Right. Like it's sacrilegious <laughs> for a comic book person to be like, yeah, Neil Gaiman, not a fan. Um, but I'm not. And so I decided not to do it. <laughs> it's, it's funny you say that. I mean, that that's actually a good point. But it's funny you say that you're not a fan because you're the one that turned me on to his book on the Norse mythology. Well, so here's the thing, though, is that's just kind of a retelling of other Norse stuff. Like, none of what he did there was actually, like, super original. Um, mm-hmm. And I like his voice, but if you look at um, the show that they – the Terry Pritchard book that he co-wrote. Um, good Omens. Good Omens, right? The reason that book is so good is because of Terry Pritchard. Mm-hmm. Well, down. see, that, yeah, that's why I will d- disagree in, in a way. One, I am not a fan of Sandman. I've tried to read it a couple times. It just doesn't connect with me. Nothing about it. I, I don't know. It just, I just gave up because it wasn't drawing me in. There is a word for Sandman. It's self-indulgent. Well, I, I really honestly, I, I don't so. think I've read enough of it to be able to say. Yeah. Anyway, so. That, that it's like that. 
Yeah, but like so Daryl's doing his Thursday thing. I'm gonna try and pick something up on like Tuesdays or something like that to to start doing. Um, but this week I just I could not get beyond um my dislike for Neil Gaiman to actually be like objective. So I just wanted to call that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I keep forgetting that he wrote Stardust. I never read it, but yeah. I thought the I thought uh, Daredevil was you know pretty good in it. <laughs> he had he could see then. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, well, I mean, he could see on uh, Downtown Abbey too. So, uh, I've actually I'm just looking at his his novels, and I've only read American Gods. Yeah, I did not like American Gods at all. I liked American Gods. I tried to read Anansi Boys and it didn't yeah i just stopped reading it so i mean i've but, tried yeah. I, I i've given it i've given it a shot I've, I've tried and i just don't like it so i did read like one of his like smoke and mirrors his short story collection which i actually liked i really like that cool but yeah I, i'm looking at it. I, I haven't read much of his stuff at all yeah but uh, yeah like i said i know everybody talks about how good sandman is and it's mm-hmm. classic and it just does it it just didn't do it for me yep so Cool. All right. So let's actually move on to news bites. Um, first up is our favorite cousins in Hollywood, the Amels. Uh, Robbie and Stephen Amell to star in Code 8 sequel. Um, so Deadline had the exclusive on this one. Robbie and Stephen Amell are expanding the Code 8 universe after spearheading the crowdfunded original film. The cousins are set to reprise their roles in the sci fi sequel. Code 8 Part 2. Jeff Chan is also returning to direct. Uh, Chan also pinned the screenplay with Chris Pear, uh, who wrote Code 8, as well as uh, Serene Lee and Jesse LaVercombe. And the plot centers around the 4% of people living in the fictional Lincoln City who possess special abilities and are often confronted by advanced militarized police technology. Uh, we talked about this actually when we, before Daryl was the permanent co-host, we actually did an episode where he was the guest and we talked about this. Um, Daryl turned me on to this movie. I love this movie. I actually bought it for full price on iTunes when it came out. Yeah. I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan of this movie and I am very happy to see that all the, like Chan is returning and oh yeah, Perret is returning to to write the script because again for stories like this that are you know smaller and it's well i won't say just stories like this in general when you're doing a sequel it's very nice to have mm-hmm. the creative talent back absolutely absolutely and the fact that this was like a crowdfunded thing and mm-hmm. it did well it did okay i mean it had a it had a minor theatrical run um it raised 2.5 million on more than 35,000 backers through Indiegogo to make it the second largest crowdfunded original film of all time. Um and there was uh, a short form series in the works that was going to go on Quibi before Quibi went under and became um Roku Plus or whatever it's called. Uh, but Stephen Amell had a great – or Robbie, I'm sorry, had a great quote here. There's nothing better than working with your family and friends. Uh, Code 8 was the embodiment of that, and I can't wait to get back to work on the sequel. And Stephen said, Code 8 is an incredibly personal and special project for us all. We built the world in the first one, and now we're ready to blow it out, which has me super excited because there's so much more story to tell than what we saw Um and even if it doesn't focus on on Robbie's character, um, blowing it out to see more of the uh, of the I'm just gonna say supers in that world, I think would be really interesting. Yeah, and I think we said that when we talked about it uh, before. And I know one of the things I said is that I I just want to see more of that world. And even if I'm not totally jazzed by the I mean, there's a certain lack of i mean a, sl- a certain lack of originality i guess with the story itself again this is just a treatment in the sense of two sentences of what the story is about i mean it's like days I of want, future past right yeah i, mean, it's I kind I, of I, that yeah and one of the things i said is you know is is the antagonist antagonist in this one is it going to be more about the system or are we going to have someone 
like a, a representation of that in like a mark a Marcus Sutcliffe was in the first one. Yeah, that's what I'm curious about and how they go about it. Uh, if this was, I I just I trust it because these are the same people that did the first one. Yep, and I'm really. Yeah, I I wanted more. You know, I thought mm-hmm. the first one. I really liked the first one. It had some shortcomings, but I, it was it still it was one of those that, like, if you look at it singularly as a movie, it's okay. It's it's had some great parts, but it just the way it opened up another world. And again, it's not a world we haven't seen before, but there was something about theirs, maybe because it was smaller, more intimate, mm-hmm. that really I really connected with, and I really wanted to see more of yeah so i'm yeah. so ex- i'm really excited about this news so all right before we move on <clears throat> in the deadline comments uh the very first comment would love to see emily beck records do a at least a cameo appearance her and her and not her and her and steven were amazing together in arrow the, the reply to that move on already or you could just watch arrow on netflix and respect his decision to move forward with his acting producing and producing career <laughs> yes yeah that let's let's not put her back in there and and like evoke the name of elicity ever again uh <laughs> elicity 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 dude now they're gonna show up and annoy you for the next five thousand years <laughs> <laughs> anyway all right moving on to the next story um seth rogan is rearing his <sighs> ugly hipster head um so this one comes from IGN. Uh, Seth Rogen's CG animated reboot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles has a release date, but it won't be out for a while. While um, Rogen's pedo ass announced on Twitter. Oh, uh, let me rephrase that. Rogen announced on Twitter that it will be out in theaters August 11th, 2023. Um, so this will be the second animated uh, Ninja Turtles reboot. Uh, story the last one was tmnt which had a pretty decent voice cast and and was actually kind of a fun story um about an immortal dude who was just trying to bring his his family back from being stone um statues and and the ninja turtles needed to stop the him opening a portal that would unleash like aliens and war and, and stuff on the planet earth um but yeah, so after what Rogan has done to Invincible, um, to my voice just went up at the end there like it was a question. Yeah. Uh, after what Rogan has done to Invincible, I am not at all interested in him in him touching my Ninja Turtles. Yeah. So my notes I have after Invincible. Well, need I say more? Meaning, I'm not excited about this at all. I don't trust him with any property. I don't trust him like at all with any properties like this, which, and one of the things, this is very interesting because, you know, this is released in 2023. Evidently we're going to get another animated turtles movie from Netflix later this year. called Rise of the teenage mutant Ninja Turtles, which is tied to the current series. Yeah. So I would, I haven't watched much of that. I I had, I have been reading, the comic from you know the last few years and i i, I need to get back into it but no that was you, really you good. don't need to get back that into was... it after episode 100 they when they put uh jenica as the main character so jenica has her own book and jenica is the main character of tmnt uh of teenage mutant ninja turtles and the turtles make cameos now that's not the teenage mutant ninja turtles no it it is not absolutely not and and it like the um the writer they uh oh i forget the they have a single word name um but th- they're a great artist but not a good writer and it's very evident and there's a lot of just self insertion like is going on with the rest of of comics like my name is not starfire yeah exactly where the penguin and starfire had a baby um <laughs> i mean that's what it looks like i'm sorry that's what it looks like absolutely but, it does um but no, Thinking Critical did a great piece on this with um with a guy who's an, a Ninja Turtle like historian. Um that that was that was really, really, really good. But yeah, no, I agree with you. Like I love that IDW comic. Um but I mean it's only selling like five thousand books a month now. Wow. 
I mean, think about that. Like, like there was a point where it was selling, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 books in a month. Uh, big issues might even reach a hundred thousand, but like maybe, you know, it just depended on, on what was happening. Um, now it's at 5,000. It's at like five. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Like they were conjecturing that like IDW is maybe trying to, to get, be able to just step away from the license. Wow. Yep. Anywho, but yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I mean, what else can we say? We're not, we're not excited to see Seth Rogen get his grubby pot so tans on anything that we love. <laughs> yeah. I, so yeah, I, I really have no interest. I know I will not be going to the movies to see this. No, if I see it at all. I mean, if I see but... it, I might sail the seven seas. So, yeah. So with, with Surfshark, <laughs> and I mean, and again, they have it's a Jeff Rose attached to directing it, and he's you know been involved with Gravity Falls, yeah. Connected, which I have I don't know what Connected is, and Disenchantment, I which I know the the Gravity Falls and Disenchantment. I can't stand that type of animation. But Gravity I don't Falls know. is amazing. I was about to say I don't know how good the story is, so but it's like. The, the animation for stuff like that, it kind of, it turns me off, honestly. Oh, really? The Gravity Falls animation yeah. is not bad. The Disenchanted is just like, I, I think it's done by Simpsons people, but it's just kind of a, yeah, Simpsons, I think so. not, a Simpsons knockoff. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I, I tried to watch it. I, I made it through four episodes and I was like, yeah, I've, I've, yeah. I've put as yeah, I've, much, I've put more time than this deserves into it. Yeah, I've been hearing a lot about Gravity Falls. I for the longest time I was like, "What the hell is this?" Yeah, so it's, it's funny. Um, you know, but here's the thing though: is I also when Bob's Burgers came out, I was like, "This show isn't going to last eight episodes," and it's in like season eleven now. So what do I know? <laughs> um, and it's still yeah, yeah. not it's still not funny. Um, <laughs> so people love it though. It's whatever to each their own. Uh, all right, let's go on to why the last man news. Uh, Ease. It's called Ease. Oh, I'm sorry. We're talking about the book, not the video game. Sorry. What? Continue. So there's a game called Ease, and it's oh. why, it's like that wise, but oh. they, it's pronounced Ease. No, this yes. is why the last uh, man, I'm... because of the chromosome. Yes. The chromosome that men's have that women's don't. Anyway. Um, so why the last man series officially set at a September premiere date, September 13th to be exact. Um, if you're not familiar, it's a comic book series in a post apocalyptic world written by Brian K. Vaughn, who is, um, one of my three favorite comic writers, uh, and art by the amazing P. Guerrera, uh, Pia Guerrera. Let me rephrase that. Um, and this is, <laughs> this show has been in production several times. This is the first, this is the first time it's actually got a release date and been picked up for series. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually excited about this. I love FX. I think FX does a great job with everything that they do. And, uh, I am a little concerned about the, um, the turnover in the showrunner role that happened. Uh, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I am willing to give it the benefit of the doubt because it is, uh, FX. Um, they also have, um, American horror story talking about that coming back. And then they have American crime story, uh, impeachment. So we know what that's going to be about. Hard pass. Uh, I will Although say they were making a big deal about the logo. The logos for all these shows look the same on FX now. Yeah, they, which is yeah. kind of sad. Um, I don't like that. Yeah. But you were gonna say something. I was, I was gonna say what's interesting is, and I know this doesn't have to do with Wise, but American Horror Stories uh, is have they're having an anthology series come out that's is it? where every week is a different story. Okay, because I was gonna say, isn't this show an anthology series? Yeah, so the like the show is anthology in the sense that each season is different. This is each episode is different. So I I, I think that's kind of interesting to see how, that they're going that route with it. I don't know if the original American Horror Story is going to stay on. I, I haven't watched it in a few years. I've tried to get back to it on Netflix, but yeah, it just hasn't vibed with me. But I'm I'm I am kind of excited to see what they do with why. 
I, and to your to your point, anytime there's a turnover with a showrunner or something along that deep into production, or to, whether it be a showrunner for a, a TV series or or a director for a movie. I get antsy because generally that means there's going to be a lot of issues with the tone and consistency of what we get in a story because it's going to be two different voices telling it. So I'm hoping we this doesn't fall into that same trap because I do this I do really appreciate the comic. I might not have liked how it ended. But I really, really like the story. You, you didn't, you didn't like how it ended, dude. I, yeah, I did not. I think I called you when it happened, and I'm like, "What the f? That is bullshit." I, I loved it. It was oh. so from out of left field. It was great. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it made sense. Actually, it, it really did kind of make sense the the way they did. I mean, I, I don't mind that, but like, I, I just, I couldn't stay. I was like, yeah. this. It, it, and again, when I say I don't like the ending, it did not make me dislike the comic because sometimes an ending can re- the miss from Stephen King <laughs> is a perfect example. The the book, the movie changed the ending where it completely messes up everything for me, the journey of the characters throughout the book or throughout the movie. Right. And before that, it was a very good adaptation. A lot of things changed. I know. It was a very good adaptation, but the ending itself completely changed the theme of the story. Yeah. What, the, that didn't happen here. Like you said, it makes sense, but it doesn't mean I liked it. So You don't and have it, again, to like it, it but you yeah. have to you do have to admit it made sense. Um, well, I don't have I mean it it doesn't necessarily have to admit it made sense, but it does make sense. You know, it, it yeah, yeah, there's a difference. And so. and again, that doesn't change. It doesn't change my enjoyment of the overall product, which was my original. Although I, I will say, as this. as we were prepping and, and we were talking about this and we were going through the IMDb, it's like, you know, there's a lot of women in this. It's like, well, yeah, because there's yeah. only one man left in the world, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's a there's there's a couple billion women left. Um, I, I'm interested to see what happens. Uh, the weird thing is the woman playing hero. Um, who is is York's sister um is played by Olivia Th- Thrillby T Tr- yeah T H R I L B Y uh she's listed as in being all in all 10 episodes and it's like here doesn't show up for a little while um yeah. you know so I, I I'm I saw that but um I I thought the lady they they cast to play agent 355 actually looks hold on where'd she go um yeah Uh, Ashley Romans uh, looks like the way they they drew three five five in the um, in the comic, which is cool. Uh, and I don't really know her from from much of anything because um, I didn't watch Shameless, and that was the show she was probably most famous for. Um, yeah, I would say that. But but yeah, and then um, the girl playing Beth was was a weird choice too. Um the the girl who he's trying to get back to is played by Juliana Canfield who um was on a few episodes of Success oh well, I'm sorry she's been in all the episodes of Succession um which I like her. I'm not I'm not complaining about her as an actress. I just I th- I think it, it was just kind of a weird choice um cuz she's always comes across as like pretty serious and dour. And and Beth's character is very um, freewheeling and and you know fun, um, so we'll see. Like, but it's called acting for a reason, right? So I'm, right. I'm I'm not I'm not judging anything by by anything there. And you know we'll see if Diane Lane, as a mother to York Brown, is as much of a monster as she was to Clark Kent. That's the gift that keeps on giving. Dude, they were monsters. Monsters. Flat out. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm never not gonna talk about that. <laughs> I mean, we came out of the theater and I was ranting about that. And yeah. I'll never forget because we went to the sneak preview and your your friends were looking at me like, um, Daryl, what's wrong yeah. with your buddy? <laughs> <laughs> monsters they were all normie superman people too so it's fine i get it 
No, uh, Scott. Well, one of the guys, Scott. He's actually yeah, in, one big in the comics. But the rest of them. Yeah. Well, what? Well, one. Yeah, the other ones were definite normies. But, but yeah. Yeah. And he. Yeah. He doesn't. He still doesn't like it. Um, Man of Steel. You know, honestly, like I came around on it just because of how much I like Henry Cavill. Um, still not stoked with the ending of that movie, but that is neither here nor there because that's not what we're talking about. Uh, yeah. All right, Jupiter's legacy. Um, wah, wah. <laughs> right? <laughs> big bucks, big bucks, no whammy. Stop. Oh, <laughs> Jupiter's legacy got the whammy. Um, okay, so this again coming from Deadline. Jupiter's legacy has got the axe. All of the the stars have been released from their multi-season contracts, so they're free to start taking roles doing whatever they're doing and netflix is now turning jupiter's legacy into an ins- a universe spanning anthology franchise um the next live action malar world book set to fill the void is super crooks so it looks like they're just gonna like throw malar world content on the wall until they see what sticks um, yeah which is never a good it's rarely a good thing. No, that's a, that's 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 a, a no bueno uh, way to. to that's make that's like Disney sequel trilogy type stuff. Oh, I don't. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> Was so. that fighting words there? Almost? No, I, I don't think it's that bad. Um, <laughs> so, but um, I've been watching a ton of um, the Screen Rant guy who does the the pitch meetings. Oh, I love him. I Ryan fell down George. the Robert, Ryan George. Yeah, I fell down the rabbit hole, and I, I went and I watched all the Star Wars. I did. They have a big Star Wars one that's like an hour and a half long, but I, I just watched the individual ones over the last few days. Yeah, he's <laughs> dude, he is so good. Uh, what's what's he say when it's when something's like simple and oh it, uh, oh this I bet that'll be hard. Oh, it'll be super easy, barely yeah. an inconvenience. Yeah, super easy, barely an inconvenience. That's what this is canceling. Jupiter's Legacy for for Netflix was super easy and barely an inconvenience because yeah. they let the production team take the story of Jupiter's Legacy, throw it into a blender, drink it, poop it out, and then throw it on the wall. Yes, wow. that's graphic. Yeah. Um. Yeah. C- considering they 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 did at, at no point did they uh, have a clear and coherent story. Uh, they failed to make anything that resembled a point and may God have mercy on our souls because we were all yeah. dumber for having watched it. Yeah. And that's not to say, again, I, if you listen to our review, I enjoyed aspects of it, but also a lot of it fell short because one of the things you said, and this was when I, because I think I watched it before, I started watching it before you, I should say. Yeah. And I mentioned the flashbacks, and you said it's not going to be like Arrow, is it? With the, every episode having a flashback, and mm-hmm. and what you said is that whole the whole flashback could have been taken care of in the first two episodes. That should have and, been what the, every flashback should have been the first two episodes. Yes, so because there was so much in the flashbacks that did not amount to anything yeah. and did and weren't necessary. His whole trip to you know Kansas, and when he saw Kurtwood Smith, yeah. Smith or yep. There was no point in that. Yep. None. Yeah, Red Foreman blowing his brains out was unnecessary. Like, honestly, like, the pitch meeting for this would have been like, yeah, they got on a boat and went to an island and they got powers. Oh, well, why was that? Oh, it was super simple, barely an inconvenience. Like, yeah. because the, them getting their powers is not the story. And no. that's what they made the story is how these people acquired powers and why the world was the way it was. When in reality, it was how these people used their powers – and why the world was the way it was and why their kids were were revolting against them um and but to have the rest of the union just constantly turning on Sheldon like it was one thing for Brainwave to do it um because he was really the bad guy um it was another thing for for Lady Liberty to do it and you know it was just it was it was ill conceived the way they did it they went for, you know, just looks, you know, style over substance. Um, yes. And they, they you know, it, it fairly gets compared to the boys as a, you know, not a good version of the boys. 
<clears throat> even though like I, I think it's unfair to put it in the same category as the boys, but it had that look and feel to it. Yes. And it, it, it just didn't get the drive and audience that they were expecting because of the product that was created. Yeah. And Josh Dumel should definitely stick to comedy. Like he's he's a he's such a good comedic actor. Like, you know, Transformers was fine, but Transformers was more about robots than soldiers. Yeah. Um, you know, but I mean if you watch like go watch Buddy Games. He's freaking hilarious in that. Yeah. I I I, I was I went halfway through that and that movie is it's hard to watch funny. in one sitting. Yeah. But <laughs> so, he's he I, I actually like him. It's yeah. because Nick Swartzen is aggressively unfunny now. Oh my gosh. Yes. Like Nick Swartzen. 100%. Nick Swartzen used to be hilarious. Nick Swartzen is now aggressively unfunny. Um and, and he I don't ruins think I've ever heard that term before. Anything that he's in. So yeah. Ah, <sighs> so uh yeah so be on the lookout for super crooks it didn't say when it's coming out but so another thing about this uh there is going to be a super crooks anime eight episode anime series yeah. uh coming out later this year but the actual live action version that we're talking about right Sorry, is yeah. just kind of ramping up yeah I, I thought that was very interesting that there was going to be an anime version uh, or an I'll, animated version of honestly this. i don't know why they don't just do it as an animated version um, yeah, and just just don't have Seth Rogen near it. <laughs> Go get the team that did Spawn. <laughs> have them come in. Oh, that was yeah. Um, but but yeah, I, you know it's it's just one of those things. Like Millar's got a ton of stuff. Like Millar was a, a thirty year overnight success in the comic book industry. Um, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, but he he's done great work and he's written really cool stuff. And he, when he struck out on his own to do books like Kick Ass and Super Cooks, and Jupiter's Legacy, and you know all all of this stuff that he's done, um, he was super successful because he's really good at what he does. Um, but don't chunk your story up, and and you know don't don't change the what what it what is fundamentally the core of your story. That's, yeah. that's all I can say. Uh, I'll buy yeah. that one. So, but yeah, like you said, they're like in the future, they're looking at doing a prodigy show. Yep. Like from his, and yep. also this six, this live action six episode spy series, which there are scant details on this. Yeah. On this stuff, but yeah, he's. I mean, again, like you said, because of the major deal they did, we're going to see a lot more of Valar. And again, I really enjoy his comics. I just. Like you said, just pay not don't pay just homage. Just use the source material as as your Bible. Don't get fancy with it. Yeah, you know, don't try to be ultra creative. Millar was creative when he did that. Yeah. So oh, he yeah. has he you know you have the instruction booklet on what to do. Listen to what I'm saying, Seth Rogen, who will never hear what I'm saying. But they had it with Invincible, and granted, I won't put all the blame on him because Kirkman was involved. But with this, I don't know how much Millar is in. I'm, I would assume he's involved. I don't know about the day to day stuff, yeah. but I look, I, I'm trust... not giving him a free pass for this in by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. Right. I mean, at, at the end of the day, his name is attached to it and it's a property yeah. that he created. So if it's bad, it's on him. But, but, he he's got a plethora of things. Like I mean, Kingsman is great. Yeah, the second Kingsman I love, but I I understand it is it is objectively a bad movie, right? Yeah. Um, right. Or I'm sorry, it is objectively a bad story, but it, it wasn't because it w it was based off of something bad. It was just poorly executed. The execution, so. yes. Although I did love that final three, like that two on one fight. Yeah. With Oberon. Yeah. Over, oh, that's what we're calling him Oberon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's that's where we are in Game of Thrones right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, Oberon yeah. Martel. Oberon, you can't wear a helmet. It obstructs my vision. Shh, shh, shh. Hey, you we, can't hear you know, me. 
Well, she listens to this, so I don't know if we'll be there by the time she I just uh, said it obstructs out. his vision. I didn't say anything yeah. about his pew. And he must see far. <laughs> that's, okay, that's, Legolas. Like, that's, or uh, uh, no. Leonidas. Leonidas. Yeah, that's eight episodes, maybe eight episodes. Shh, away. we haven't told what that is yet. Just saying. You just ruined it. I didn't ruin it. It's You're good, ruining it by talking about it's it. It's a good thing nobody listens to this crap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to the boring batch. Um, I'm sorry, I keep calling it that. The bad batch. <laughs> Episode six, decommissioned, directed by uh, Nathaniel Villanuevu, written by Amanda Rose Munoz. Um, released today. June 4th. Uh, Amanda Rose Munoz has been involved with a lot of the Star Wars cartoons. This is her first writing credit. She's been a script supervisor on the Clone Wars, uh, the Resistance, and Rebels. She was actually the script supervisor and continuity person for the final four episodes of the Clone Wars. Which Oh, really? Is the best Star Wars has ever been. Um, Right up there with the last season of Rebels. The last six episodes of Rebels. Uh, yeah. So I, when I saw her name, I had high hopes. Um, You texted me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pull my phone up because I don't want to misquote you. Um, you, you. You texted me. Can't wait to see your BB reaction. Laughing face emoji. I replied, that bad. You said normal, meh, but the characters they run into. And I asked more fan service cameos. You said, I guess you could call it that with a sly face. Um, <laughs> so this was all at 1026 in the morning. Uh, at 1026, when I turned it on within the first, like I had turned it on when we were going back and forth. Um, I'm sorry. That was at 908. At 1026, I replied to you with two sick face emojis and a puking emoji. Um, and then I used an expletive for the SJW sisters. And I, I like they never should have introduced those characters into this world. And adding them to the Bad Batch made the Bad Batch look even worse as jobbers. Um, especially because the, the most interesting underlying factor of this series so far is what's going on in Wrecker's head. Yes. And that was the only – that – and, again, I, I like Omega. I think Omega is an interesting character. She's trying to be a part of the team. And yeah. they, 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 they show her working, and she listens, and she takes criticism. Like, she doesn't just sock off when somebody's like, oh, you're bad at that, and, you know – Sid's like, you need to have a stronger arm. And I'm just jumping all over the place. <laughs> so, all right. So this episode, Sid sends the Bad Batch to retrieve the uh, the data packet from a Separatist tactical droid because they're all being decommissioned on Corellia and destroyed. And since the tactical droids were the ones who fought the Republic, now the Empire, that information is very sought after, um, especially from, say, the criminal underworld or the Rebellion. Yeah. But they get there, they get to Corellia, and they run into Trace and Rutha, um, who are just insufferable. So the funny thing about this is that I, I did not see their introduction in Clone Wars. So I have no background, right. no dislike, nothing that, that about that with these characters. You didn't have the built-in... Sick, sick, pukey face. Yeah. But halfway through this episode, I just said, I said out, I was like, I just do not like these characters one bit. Mm -hmm. I was like, I, I, I kept trying, but I, I didn't like them. And then something clicked in my head and I said, let me see who these people are. And I looked and then I looked at the, you know, IMDb for Clone Wars. And mm -hmm. that's when I just laughed. I was like, yeah, these are the same people that I was worried about or mm -hmm. not worried about, mm -hmm. was warned about in Clone Wars. They were just, they're just unlikable. 
they're just they, bad. They're bad characters. They're bad. They're, they're yeah, they're bad characters. Good. Like they got Ahsoka into trouble with the Pike Syndicate because the one couldn't get out of her own way and destroyed all of their spice drugs that they were smuggling for them. And yeah, it was just, you know, um, I don't know. The, I, I do. I did. I did really like when they when they were on Corellia and and Hunter was calling out positions and he's like, "Record, you're on Overwatch," and he's like, "That's Crosshair's job." Yeah, and that really I, made me laugh. But here's the thing: if you're putting someone on Overwatch, wouldn't making Echo Overwatch make more sense than your your main bruiser? Yeah, because, you know, he's a tank and, you know, with tanks, you have to be up close and personal. I will say this episode did was the first time since I think the first episode that they actually looked like they were halfway decent and not, you know, having to get rescued. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. I mean, but, they like they didn't have to get rescued, but they, they still yeah. like, I mean, got they, jobbed out by the SJW sisters. Yeah, I, I just... Again, going back to what I like about this show or what what I liked about this episode, I like Omega. I, I, I just love Omega as a character. I, I'm very curious to see how she develops and what is the, the mystery surrounding Omega. But also when Wrecker, again, bumps his head, which it's almost a running joke now, but it's going to pay dividends in the future. I know because you hear that when he says, when he kind of reiterates a good soldier always. Yeah. And he, but he doesn't you know, finish the line. He doesn't finish that's it, the beauty which was, it. yes, I, that's what I loved. He doesn't finish that. And then, you know, he comes back and, you know, gets, gets, gets the job done. Yep. Those uh, outside of that and outside of hunters, finally looking like, the you know the squad commander again in the sense of like you said calling out orders mm -hmm. doing this and that and it was another not a bad episode in the sense of what happened it's just and there was some action so i can't say it was boring from an action standpoint but it was more boring from a story standpoint and it doesn't help having two characters that are just that five minutes into seeing them on screen i'm like i don't like these characters well yeah and i feel like with echo and tech there's a whole lot of um overlap overlap yes and yeah. i think i think making tech the one who turned would have been a little more interesting than 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 crosshair mm -hmm. because again Cro crosshair is my my favorite bad batch member um because he did that whole thing with the mirrors when they were running away yeah. through the uh through the ship um in the in the third or fourth in the fourth episode of the clone war season seven um yeah so again this show isn't bad right it, it, it's good it's just boring it, it's just more of the same every week and i want i want something like I want the I want the Omega story to progress. Like I want that to yeah. be the A story. I want I want them trying to figure out why Finnick Shand is after her, not going and 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 doing the heist of the week poorly. Um I, like doing the occasional heist as like the B story for that episode or having to fix a ship or what's going on with Wrecker's head. All make excellent B stories. But the A story should be Hey, we're keeping Omega safe instead of we're doing whatever we can to throw Omega into the most danger she could yes. possibly be in. Right. Um, yeah. It, the warp. Um, it's it's just this, this was funny because when I was getting ready this afternoon uh, or this morning, sorry, um, I had I just had my phone on and I just had Facebook videos going in and the war one of one of them came up and it was a people's court type thing where it's harvey dent versus batman and robin about child endangerment and you know he was he was making the excuse that robin that batman had as a non-consensual minor putting him in danger and you know the reason he wears red is so people shoot at robin and not batman um <laughs> you know and then he pulls out like stephanie brown and damien and jason todd and all the, Ro the the robins have all been killed and and <laughs> batman's like most of them came back to life um, actually, all three of them. Well, two of them came back to life. Stephanie Brown never actually died, but um, that's beside the point. Uh, sorry, I digress. Um, but like, 
as I was watching this, it was like, uh, yeah, these guys should definitely be pulled up on, on child abuse charges because yeah. she's not even trained. She's lived in a in a, a hermetically sealed lab all of her life. I don't understand how she hasn't gotten like massively ill. <laughs> yeah. And also she has a laser bow that she can barely hold, you know, pull back because she's not strong enough consistently, I should say. And yeah, so when they land on Corellia and she is like right there running out with them, mm-hmm. I I thought that was <laughs> talk about gross negligence right. on their part. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but but again, like sh- she had the uh, the bow and arrow. She couldn't use it very well. Uh, she got she actually only got one good shot off. Right. Uh, right. And, and it was it was just like with the. um the blaster uh in in the first episode where she got that lucky mm-hmm. shot off it, w- it was just a lucky shot like like i i love how there there's if there's anyone out there complaining oh omega is a marusu uh you're wrong just stop oh that, that's not even yeah you're absolutely wrong so that's that's not even a discussion we'll entertain but all right um so i, I i'm glad this episode's over I'm I'm definitely not going to watch it again. Um, out of five, I'd probably give it a three. Yeah, I, I'm at three too. And again, I I like told, a low I've said three. This, <laughs> yeah, I've said this a few times. When I watch one of these, and I don't care about watching some of my favorite reactors watch it, that tells you enough about it. Well, I like told this you, next- like the dog woke me up at four thirty in this morning. And any other time with any other Star Wars show, I would have just stayed up and watched it. I wouldn't have bothered going back to bed. I was like, nah, I'm going to go back to bed. I'll watch this after my morning meetings. <laughs> yeah. Like, so. I went to the gym, had a bunch of meetings, took a shower, watched it. <laughs> you know how much we're over it in this sense? of, I mean, this episode, again, not giving us what we want, is that you didn't say, well, out of five X, you know, Fill in the blanks. There's, you just said, I'll yeah. give it a three. Yeah. I just not. That's That says it all right there. Yeah. It's boring. It really is. It's not, like I said, it's not bad. It's just boring. So. So. Anywho. All right. Um, so moving on to our last topic of the That's day. not boring. Uh, the, the best superhero show on the CW history. Um, not... Because Smallville was never on the CW. It was on the WB. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Holding the Ridge, episode eight, uh, directed by Norma Bailey, written by Christy Korzak. Um, this is not my favorite episode of the season, but it is not far off. Yes. Uh, we had so many cool reveals this week. Uh, Lois... You know, Lois, Bitsy Turlock, Elizabeth Turlock carried the episode. Um, Oh, absolutely. Like, no, she doesn't. No, she's getting full respect, Lois. Like, you know, I mean, it's still Soups and Lolo. Don't get me wrong. But uh, Lois carried the episode. And, you know, it, it, it it was one of those things that it was great to see her front and center. Um, But not only did they make her look powerful. But they made her an equal to Superman and John Henry Irons in the matter of how powerful they are in this universe with what they are powerful at. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, And then I loved everything with the boys this week. I thought it was fantastic. Um, If we can get more Jordan episodes like this, I would be very happy. Yeah, it's, and to to carry out on that point, so I have Lois absolutely as the MVP of this episode. Everything about what she does, I love how they started the episode with her talking to the therapist. When, mm-hmm. Funny enough, a few weeks ago I was talking about how I like when you have a show that says that, that Imedia race and then says two hours beforehand. Mm-hmm. I like how they did this one, though, yeah. where – just you would just get bits and pieces of her conversation as the story unfolded. 
And when you, you talked about her being powerful, mm-hmm. I think that's a m- massive point because Jonathan looks at her like that because he says, and again, we'll get a little bit into the story. He mentions how he's the only one in this family, you know, basically that doesn't that doesn't have a super a power, not a superpower. He, but he doesn't have powerful. a weapon. He doesn't have a weapon. Yes, he doesn't have a weapon. So, yes. Um. Yeah. I, I thought so. I've always looked at like Clark and Jonathan as like the pair, and then Jordan and Lois is the pair, and I I feel like that's how Lois probably looks at it as well a little bit. And seeing the two of them team up was really cool. And the bond that was formed with them in this episode, um, Mm -hmm. which I think goes beyond not just the bond that was formed with them, but the respect that the two of them developed for John Henry Irons. Yes. I think was really, 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 really cool. Um, and I, I'm just going to say it like Wally Park is the most underrated part of this show. Yeah. I, I, what I said, he could, my notes, he continues to impress me. Um, the spinoff I, steel. I, I, I'd be a hundred percent in for that. I would, I'd be all for that. I, I would be all for that. Uh, the other thing, like, you know, if John David Washington isn't available, maybe like Wally could play black Panther. <laughs> You know that ship has sailed already, don't you? <laughs> well, you know, they just opened Avengers Campus, and they talk about T'Challa. Like, he's there. Like, they've already recast him. What's the big deal? <laughs> Seriously, they don't have Shuri running around as Black Panther there. Yeah. So, of course, they do have Black Widow, but she's constantly falling off of things. It's very weird. <laughs> Monster. <laughs> <laughs> anyway um no but like the 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 whole thing with um with the rv this week was interesting um which is essentially a wikipedia of you know john's world um or john henry irons because there's two johns um of his world and and getting to watch that version of clark who has no relation to Lois or the boys at all, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because Jonathan did ask, like, there's versions of everybody in every different world. And, you know, you notice Lois didn't tell him, well, there's not a version of you on his world. Yeah. I mean, it kind of became very obvious, like, very quickly. But the look on his face when, when she didn't, like, say, yeah, like, even you, what was kind of weird, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know when when it was still supergirl um you know john was a baby he was the only kid and then when the crisis event happened that's when clark was flying back and 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 you know uh lois is like yeah the twins and he was like huh yeah that yeah that was <laughs> and it it just i think that also makes it work so much better right. having you know, these Jonathan and Jordan and yep. speaking of Jordan, I'm talking about Jordan Elsass, the actor who plays Jonathan. Yeah. Dude, he, he is so good in this episode yep. and just how he matches like in scenes, even for a young actor, he matches in scenes, you know, that intensity needed. And, and sometimes it's not what he says. It's like you said, it's a look he gives or, and that you can see like that of him, like breaking down inside when, mm-hmm. when some of the things happen. He, and... did, he had a great emotive face this week. Yes. Um, like, he does not suffer from Tom Welling face at all <laughs> um, as a young actor. Neither one of them do. Um, but, no, I mean, I liked it. I liked, I liked like, the C or D storyline that's going on with Kyle. Um, yes. Yes. Kyle has kind of turned a quarter as an interesting character now. He's not just the drunk fire chief who doesn't really love his smoking hot wife. Um to now he's he wants something and Lana's in the way of it and yeah. it, it's going to be really interesting to watch him break bad um, yeah and and one of the things i put is uh, he was what the unexpected star yeah. in the sense of you know you actually especially that scene it was so touching that scene where they're you know he's yeah you know, hey i got my guitar and how excited he was getting when yeah. Sarah was talking about maybe you know about the talent show, mm-hmm. just that 
banter because he's in a way they've sort of made up uh, he's sort of made up with Lana although you know this episode throws a wrench in things when uh LL what's her name Laura Lar. Lar, Lars Lar Lar yeah kind of Lar. purposefully yeah throws Lar, that Lar. wrench yeah. in it yep but yeah he's a character that you know he has his demons and he wants to I think he's getting to the point he wants to be he knows he needs to be better. Mm-hmm. He knows he needs to be a better father. He knows he needs to be a better husband. But he has that, you know, that addiction or that that something that he can't kind of get over from himself. He has an inferiority so, complex. Oh, absolutely. And that's and, what's that's what drives him with everything that he and, does to prove he's he's bigger or prove he's better than what he looks at himself as. Yes. And that's why, like you said, when he breaks bad, because that's I, I, I do believe that somewhere down the road that's going to happen, whether it's because he gets exposed to X kryptonite, which that's very interesting what we hear about the X kryptonite mm-hmm. uh, or something else. Yeah, he, he's going he's going to get a carrot dangled in front of him where he it's uh, and in his mind, he's going to be this will help me prove. Yeah, make my help me prove that I am who I could be, and it will prove to my family that I am the good husband, that I am the good father that I can be, and it's gonna go all to hell for everybody involved. Did they ever introduce Bizarro and in Supergirl? I don't. How interesting would it be if he becomes Bizarro? I know it breaks the you know the clone of Superman that didn't work out right but mm-hmm. like or what if it's well, like superman has to give him like some sort of a blood transfusion type thing and it makes yeah. him bizarro like how cool would that be and to watch yeah. eric valdez play that role would be interesting yeah i was gonna say or it's it's in the case where they have the dna but for whatever reason it, it's it the instability it needs a human host and they use him as the human host experiment something yeah. like that yeah that could be cool i mean too. Uh, yeah, because I, I really liked him in this episode. Uh, it's just, he slowly, and I liked his development, you know, because when you, we first see him, he's just, not, he's he's an ass. Yeah. And seeing him slowly become, you know, a likable character with his own, with I mean, his flaws are still there. And knowing that, and, and almost seeing that train wreck, like seeing, you know, when you see, uh, say, see a car and you know that person's not paying attention and you know they're going to hit something in yeah. front of them because yep. they're not paying attention and that and that's what this is he you're what you're just waiting for the train wreck with this oh, guy yeah. but i'm i'm still it's like this scene this week especially made him a sympathetic character in my mm-hmm. mind in the sense of rooting for him and rooting for him to be able to become that good dad, become that good husband that he wants to be for his family. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. And then the DOD stuff this week was really, really good. Um, Not to be confused with the DEO from, um, from Supergirl. Supergirl. Uh, The, the actual department of defense. Um, It was really cool. Uh, Superman finding out about hell. um, I thought was interesting. Uh, 7734. Uh, the weapons that they had were were kind of cool to see a glimpse of that. Getting the the soldier that had infiltrated the DOD with the ex kryptonite was a great little reveal because they were trying to make you think it was the big guy. Yeah, uh, and I didn't really buy that. Uh, and I was like, come on, they haven't been this obvious about anything. And it wasn't until the little dude put his hand on, like, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And there's another thing that this show has done such a good job on. It's your favorite word, restraint. There were several instances. That is not my favorite word. My favorite word is sedition. We've been over this. (laughs) So when we're talking about shows and stuff, and the reasoning is, the first example of that is when Lois just completely rips into George, Mm -hmm. or Jonathan, Jonathan, I'm sorry. yeah. Yeah, and I mean, stuff that she says to him, and yeah, and again, I love how the conversation slowly peels. You know, you peel they peel away the conversation with her therapist on it. Right. But Clark's reaction to that is very, even though he, you could tell he disagreed with how she said it, mm-hmm. 
but he waited till Jonathan was out of the room. He asked her if she was okay. And I loved when she was like, I'm fine. Okay. I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> and how, and how he handles the, the whole thing. It could have been, you know, when in a lot of shows that would have turned into another fight, mm -hmm. but they, you know, they, they put it in, put it in a way where Clark can read the situation, show his support without being overly, you know, aggressive in the sense of you did this wrong mm -hmm. and, and, you know, putting her more on the defensive, the way he put her at ease almost where he says, look, I want to be the person you come to when there are issues. Mm -hmm. But if I just want you to be able to get these issues out, if I'm not that person, that's fine. What about, and then that's how they get, you know, we get to her, you know, seeing this therapist. Yep. The other, the other example is after, you know, Clark learns about hell, it could have turned out to be a with him and you know the general. It could have turned out to be another situation where, it's like you broke my trust, I can never trust you again. Right. It, it, but instead, I I really like how General Lane says, you know, when Clark says it's about trust, and he says I understand that, and it's gonna take, and I know it's gonna take me a long time for me to earn your trust back. Mm -hmm. Both of those situations could have blown up, and and you see a lot of shows would have taken that opportunity to create unnecessary conflict considering that, you know, there's already conflict around it, Unnecess an unnecessary confrontation. And instead they pull held the reins right. and said, let us, you know, show this, that these people are adults. Well, the other way they did that was when they, they, you know, they, I think they were trying to tease like, Hey, maybe there's going to be a love triangle between John Henry Irons, Lois and Superman. And they put that to bed in this episode, too, because he was like, you're not her. Yes. Like, that was great. I loved it. And I love that scene between the two of them. And, you know, because here's the thing. Lo it's Superman and Lois. It's Clark and Lois. It is. They, they are. They are a, a, an unbreakable bond. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that John Henry Ryan still doesn't know that Clark Kent is Superman tells you everything you need to know. Um, he doesn't know the whole story of Superman. He just knows yeah. that his world's kal -El, you know, he visioned his wife to death um, on national yeah. television, maybe international and, television. Who knows? Yeah. Um, so so there's that. Um, seeing him fly the ship. Wait, was that this week? Yeah. yeah. And when Clark, when yep. when the Superman was trying to break into it. Yep. That just – and again, this is one of those things that I have so many questions about what happened over there. It's great. They, they're, they're, and I they're love how they're giving it to us. Slowly rolling it out. Slowly. Yeah. Yes. But it's they're, as they roll it out, it's in it's in support of whatever the story is that week. Um, I mean, Natalie is obviously dead because that world is gone. The, the crisis destroyed that planet. Right. Um, you know, Ollie couldn't save everyone. In, in the crisis event. So, so there's that, um, Clark coming to save Jonathan in, in the murder RV was really good. Uh, that, that was just a, that was that scene where, where he was like, I'm not powerful like the rest of you. And I think it's like, no, you, you actually really are powerful, dude. Yeah. And I guess you always say that, you know, this, the dad side of Clark that we, I mean, this is a version of Clark we've never gotten nerd and, dad clark Kent uh, is my favorite thing yeah, about the show i just down. absolutely love this and how tyler hawklin plays it it's just like like for example the going back to the after lois you know yelled at jonathan the look on clark's face was like okay i'm stepping into <laughs> a you know a pit full of vipers right here i gotta watch my step <laughs> there's a pit full of landmines and there's only one possible step to get out of this so i'm just gonna yeah. fly away from it um <laughs> but no it, here's here's the thing here's here's what tyler hawkland does best as clark kent are you ready i'm ready he smiles yes that is what he does absolute best as clark kent and it, he's got a couple different versions of his smile it's usually kind of goofy but he smiles. And then he also smiles as Superman. And, you know, uh, I, I think considering he's a, a relatively diminutive guy, he has a very big shadow. Right. I mean, to that point, the first time we see him on this show or one of, as Superman, 
He's like has this goofy smile. Thanks. My mom made yeah, it for my me. My mom made it for me. I mean, great. that's that two second line right there is what sold me on the show as potentially being something what I was looking for. I mean, that, that just five that minute, line right that there. That five minute intro that, that yes. caught everybody up to speed with what was going on sold me. I was I was at the end of that five minutes. There was no way I wasn't in for at least three episodes. Yeah, I was smiling like he was. That's yeah. how I I remember that I was smiling like he was. And, and I mean, I'm, like I, getting goosebumps we're obviously thinking not about the it only right people now. who 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 feel this way. So I mean, yes. this show was averaging about one point two five million. Uh, it was one of the highest like key demo shows on TV, uh, and then it it went on its hiatus. And we're not going to talk about the conspiracies about that. Uh, but it came back to about half of its audience. It lost a little, little over 45%. Um, the second week it gained about a hundred thousand or almost, uh, what almost 60,000 viewers back. Uh, this week it gained almost, it's almost gained 180 total thousand viewers back. It was just over 900,000. That number's going to go up because Nielsen's been having some issues reporting their numbers on time. So I don't think it's going to break a million this week, but next mm -hmm. week, if it's not back at a million, I'll be shocked. Yeah. Shocked. Which is, I, I mean, that is such good news to hear that yep. because I love this show. I mean, I, I don't like this show. I love this show. Well, I mean, we it's, like we used to say, is it Tuesday yet? But now that you watched on the app with me, it's is it Wednesday yet? And, yeah. and to be honest, the fact that they show an extended version of the episode is fantastic. My only problem is, is they should put it on HBO Max as well. Yes, they like, should. Not just put it on HBO Max, air it live on HBO Max. Oh, that would... That would open this up to another audience who, again, I was going to say I have HBO Max, but there are reasons, obviously, why I have HBO Max. But how many people have something By like the these streams? By the way, next time you log into HBO Max, there are now pictures in the icons. Really? Yeah. Huh. Okay. I gave you. I picked yours. Okay. <laughs> There's a whole theme. But – Okay, <laughs> but just think of the people that don't that just have the streaming services, and say they turn on HBO Max and say, "Oh, what's this Superman right. and Lois?" Superman airs live on Tuesday nights on on HBO Max, or I can wait till the yeah. next day and watch an extended episode. Hell yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's I all think, Warner uh, Brothers uh, or Discovery Warner Brothers. Um, so <laughs> why not? Like I I've never understood why they don't do that kind of cross pollination. Um. I don't think it would cannibalize the TV ratings at all. Um, no. Because, like, I don't have cable. I don't, like, you know, we have an antenna. I typically forget we have it. Um, plus, the CW feed is not very stable, so I typically don't no. watch it. So I wait and watch it on the app the next day and have to deal with goddamn commercials. Hey, CW, put out, like, a $4 version of the app so I cannot watch commercials. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, so yeah, so this episode ends with um, everybody back at the Kent homestead. John Henry Irons gets in the uh, the RV. He tells the AI like, "Hey, delete Captain Luther. My name is John." And uh, then the AI is like, "Well, where do you want to go, John?" He said, "I don't know. Why don't you just turn off for a while? I want to drive." The next time we see him, he will be steel. I wouldn't mind that. Um, and also, we do have to. One of the things we talked, we didn't talk about, is that this ex kryptonite is not giving people. It doesn't seem that it's giving people powers necessarily. Well, in certain instances, well, it's like that power it, show that we watched on Netflix or movie, um, Project Power. Project Power, like it's blowing people up. It's yeah. like extremis. Like to be honest, it's closer yes, to extremis it, from Iron Man great than example. anything else. But yes. uh, but it's a crystal, also, not a nanotechnology. Yeah, but also, and this is where I this is where I'm kind of confused because the exposure to the ex kryptonite gave Tag his powers. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming. Yes. But as Clark was talking to General Lane, he said, like the guy that blew up a couple episodes ago said, "You're not alone." And what John Henry Irons thinks is as Kryptonians, are, is there some way that Edge is inserting 
Kryptonian sentience because that's the word Clark used. Yeah, like sentience into an, another host. And yeah, maybe. And then using the ex Kryptonite to to so I solidify that bond. Yeah, so that is very. I'm very interested to see what his end game. Well, didn't how he got Supergirl to that. Supergirl have like a generation ship with a bunch of Kryptonian like. I know, bio like her markers. aunt. Yeah, her aunt was in there, and then yeah. so there were there were other Kryptonians. Yeah, uh, so. from what I remember. Yeah. Uh, I, th- I think Toff was uh, agreeing with us in that. She, she like, absolutely yes, does. You, um, you're right. So. Okay, so I mean, we we like this. Definitely go watch this episode. I think. Um, all right, so out of five, oh, I got a good one. Out of five RV AIs, what do you what do you give this one? I give this uh, four point five. Lois was again. Bits, uh, Elizabeth Tolick was just spectacular. Yep. Uh, Jordan Elsass is Jonathan. And, you know, just held that energy. You know, th- those two were the best parts of it. Wally Park continues to impress me. You know, Tyler Hawkland, he's going to be Tyler Hawkland. <laughs> he's just been great as, as, as Supes and as Clark. Yep. Uh, and, you know, Eric Valdez as Kyle had a coming out party for yeah. me in the sense of rooting for, like, truly rooting for him to get things done. But I think we know that it's just not going to end well. Right. No, I agree. I'm, I'm a 4.5 as well. Um, like I said, it's not my favorite episode, but it's not far off. Yeah. So cool. All right. Uh, quick reminder, check out if this Uh, it's links to everything. Share the link. Um, check out our Facebook page and, um, <clears throat> actually go to Instagram because the, the, the actually no go to the Facebook page. Cause it's, it's an event. If you want to come sign up. Uh, it's free on July the 19th. It's a Monday. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, we have plans. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, yeah, if you like what you hear, check us out on um, on YouTube as well because we're 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 starting to actually do more there. And and Daryl's trailerific Thursday is is a great example of that. Yep. All right. Any last words, buddy? Yeah, just be on the lookout for. Got, I got a couple of reviews that are will be in that are in the hopper in the next week or so with Lucifer season B. Uh, I do want to look uh, talk about a little bit more of Demon Slayer, although that's twenty six episodes, so that might be a while before nice. I get to that. And, and and a couple of more things, maybe Sweet Tooth that just came out today on Netflix. But yeah, I'm definitely gonna have some stuff you know coming out you know during midweek in the next week or two. So. So, so I, look out for that. I, I got to watch the pilot of Sweet Tooth before it came out. Um, and if you were a fan of the comic, uh, be prepared. It's a Disneyized version of the show. It's not nearly as yeah, dark I, as the I've, comic. I've never. So, yeah. I've the never comic is great. The, the comic, comic is really, really good. Um, and another one on my list. Then it's just it's another it's just another where they're they're trying to open it up. to. I, I, I relate it to Lock and Key. The Netflix lock and key, not the real lock and key that was uh, the comic book. Actually, if you really like lock and key, go to Audible and uh, download the radio play. It's amazing. Oh, they have a radio play for that. Yeah, That's Catherine cool. Janeway plays um, Mrs. Locke. Uh, uh, what's her name? Kate Mulgrew. Um, it's got a huge cast. It's amazing. Uh, but yeah. All right. Any last words? That's it. All right. Have a great day, night, evening, weekend, whenever it is. And we'll talk to you guys later. Bye.